Welcome to the Idea Talks, where we discuss big ideas. The Idea Talks is a bi-weekly podcast with Josh Tice and other leaders on big ideas for life, leadership, and ministry. And I'm your co-host, Drew Polonencia, and we are glad you're here. For more information on this podcast, visit ideanetwork.church. Today's big idea is ministering to victims of sexual assault. We're joined by one of my dearest friends in life, Kimberly Combs. Enjoy this episode. Hey, man, this is the part of the episode where we're supposed to advertise my book. All right. So what do you think we should say? I don't feel bad about it. It's not a shameless plug. It's literally your book. You've put a lot of work into it. That's a good point. So you need to pick up a copy. And hey, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you buy a copy and you didn't like it, right. Drew said he'll pay it, pay for you to ship it back. That's not what I said. At least an in and out Burger. I'll ship to them. You'll ship them. If it's in on the East Coast, it'll be all spoiled, but it's fine. <laughs> hey, I'm in this book too. You are. You're actually in this book. And I, I say some things that people don't know about you. It's going to be great. It's I, I tell some stories. All right. <laughs> are you Where book? can people find this book at? Oh, that's right. And what you it's called. It. Okay. So you can pick up this book. Right. It's called The Quest for Friendship. The Quest for Friendship. Insert Galliant's music here. <laughs> that I'll really do that is, in what, post. That yeah, really it's gonna is happen. what it is. Right. It's happening right now. It's going to be the Idea Network publishing arm of our network has produced this awesome uh, resource, and I really do appreciate it. It's exciting. It really is a discussion of friendship, and I want you to pick up a copy at ideanetwork.church in the shop tab. It's the very first resource at the very top. You can pick it up, and 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 if you put in the promo code free shipping, free shipping is yours. All right. Yeah. There it is. Go do it now. The Quest for Friendship. Welcome to this edition of the Idea Talks. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, first time guest with us, Kimberly Combs. Thank you. Kimberly Combs and her husband serves uh, on staff here at Southern Hills. She plays the piano a lot. She does a lot of things for our church. Jason is our creative pastor. But before you get into our formal introduction of Kimberly, can I share my favorite memory? Please. Of Kimberly. My favorite memory of Kimberly. Uh, We traveled to Israel together. Uh, And I remember downtown Israel, there's like a market, right? And it's a good place where you can haggle to get things. And I had no, I've never seen the side of Kimberly before. Yes. She had talked this guy. I don't even remember what she was buying, but she, man, she, she talked him down. And I was like, that is, that is so impressive. I just don't have that bone in my body. So it's a manger set. It, it was sits ma- out yeah. every Christmas. And I do remember turning around and seeing you looking at me yeah. in shock. At what? one point, I'm pretty sure your, your children or the fact that your children needed to be fed was brought up in the negotiation, but it was it was amazing. So, so. true, because I can remember what the guy said. He said, what are you going to do? Take food from my family. And you're like, I have children, too. I need to feed my children. It's true. And he yeah. worked with me. It was yeah, beautiful. It was, great, so. it was great. I totally think that guy respected you. Yeah. Like, that was un. Usual. Yeah. And I loved it. I'll bet you get as much joy out of the manger set itself as it, when you see it and you're like, I totally. Oh, was it's a beautiful right, right, memory. Yeah. I do love. Yeah. So then one day when my grandchildren play with it, I'll have a great story to tell. This tells you a little bit about the personality of Kimberly Combs um, and <laughs> why we're such good friends. Uh, you've heard Jason. Um, Jason is notorious among the uh, Idea Network because he's taught a lot of stuff, led a lot of roundtables, and been on the podcast multiple times. Uh, Jason uh, and Kimberly, Fred and Kelly and Josh and Heather have been part of this Southern Hills Church here in Las Vegas for, oh golly, it seems like our whole lives together. Uh, but our relationship with Jason and Kimberly has been interesting because um, our children are all the same age. They're all best pals. And we travel together quite a bit, don't we? Oh, we love it. Yes. In fact, Disney is a favorite place of ours. Uh, you were with us in Israel as well. Yeah. We've gone several places. We took a trip to Florida, all of us went. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it's there good are a lot memories. Of stories. There are a lot of stories there. Now, we had a trip to Disney planned right before the pandemic, and we had paid for it. We yes. We had paid for the whole thing. And um, as of the airing of this episode, um, we will still have not gone to that trip. The Disney tickets are paid for. The Airbnb is paid for. The Universal. I mean, it is a big trip because Jonathan's going to college. And so we had this big thing planned. Yeah. And uh, now it'll be it'll be 18 months later. We think we're going to finally make it in in August. I know. It should have been in the record books a year ago. This is insane. But I'm no, I still get excited because the magic is still yet to come. So our friendship uh, spans. In fact, during COVID, one of our best memories during 2020 in our family is that we would watch the Sunday. Uh, we would watch the Sunday show. We'd do the the online church and stuff, and then we would go over to the Combs and we would watch movies all Sunday afternoon, and then talk conspiracy theories about. The, about it was the world. fabulous every Sunday. It was actually a great way to spend our COVID Sunday afternoons. It was great. It was a lot of fun. So, but we are we're talking specifically about um, a conversation that we've had, and you've. 
ministered to here at Las Vegas and Southern Hills many, many times. But for our audience, it's kind of a new topic. In fact, I don't think we've ever covered any kind of an aspect of sexual assault and ministering to victims of sexual assault within the Idea Network podcast at all. So the Idea Talks hasn't touched on this, but this is really your wheelhouse. This is Kimberly's um, passion, one of her ministries. Though she serves within the music ministry and the media ministry and all of these things here at Southern Hills, um, one of the things that God has called her to is really helping uh, minister to victims of sexual assault. And that's primarily because part of your story includes sexual assault when you were younger. And so to understand where somebody's coming from, understanding because you have gone through that and been through that in your own life, now being able to turn around and minister to those sexual assault victims within a local church context is huge. And now we're speaking to hundreds and hundreds of ministry leaders, and they themselves have, some of them, uh, experience sexual assault themselves, some of them their spouses have, Mm -hmm. some of them their children, and many, many within their own congregations. So the question is, where is the church's responsibility? What is the church supposed to do? How is a pastor supposed to help the people around? I mean, quite often what we do is we just kind of ignore the problem and hope it goes away. Clearly, that's not the solution. Kimberly, what are your thoughts on these things? Well, this is such a good question, and the church has a beautiful role that they can play in this. I think one of the things is we need to be aware as a church that this is a conversation we need to be willing to enter into. Mm. It is a conversation that society all around us is having, and we don't want to leave believers or unbelievers with the perspective that this is something the church doesn't touch. And so we need to be willing to enter into this conversation because we can actually offer them something through the scriptures and through what the Lord can do that no one else can. And so we need to say there's a conversation we need to have, and we also need to be able to look inwardly at our own congregation and have a knowledge of this is part of my church, and um, ignoring it doesn't change that, Mm -hmm. but I could open a door that will actually allow us to minister to believers and unbelievers in a very extraordinary way. The percentage of people that have experienced sexual abuse, I mean, it's very, very high. Our audience, I'm sure, is familiar, may not be, some of you, that I myself as a child uh, with a babysitting incident um, experienced sexual assault. I never, never um, shared this with anybody outside of our family until I was probably, I don't know, Kimberly, do you remember, just a couple years ago? Just a few years ago. Yeah, I'm probably 37 years old, comfortable enough, um, because of a sermon series I was preaching through yeah. in the text, I got up in front of the church. Drew, were you there for that? Yeah. And I said, in front of the church, I, um, I was never more nervous. Could you tell? It was pretty obvious. I read my statement, and I went into sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And, um, and even after so many years of walking with the Lord, so many years of preaching through the Word of God, very comfortable with the people, well, very comfortable with certain people like you within the church, getting up publicly and saying, hey, this was my experience when I was eight years old um, was so, so difficult. These words, shameful words are so hard to share. And we don't often see people show us how to do it too. Mm. And I just believe that Satan uses shame in such an overwhelming way. And it really holds us back from speaking. And speaking is really one of the greatest ways that we can find healing. Mm. But you were talking about um, the number of people in our church, and there are incredible percentages out there. So if you follow national statistics in this area, um, it will tell you that one in five women will walk down this road in their life. I took some time today. I was thinking of our church because this is where I minister for the most part. And if you run numbers, if you say 60% of our congregation is female, 40% is male, that's pretty typical. If you run those numbers, we're looking at 125 people who attend. If you look at our Easter services, we would have had over 200 people on property with this story. And what is really sad is national statistics will tell you only about 30% report. So these numbers are even much greater. We have statistics we can't even really work with. So this is surrounding us, whether we're aware of it or not. So hearing those large of numbers, I mean, it naturally is in the question, like how how can the church even help that group of people? 
I think if we are willing to acknowledge, first of all, there are people who come every week. And like Pastor said, it's it's the husband, it's the wife, it's the children. Someone has a story. And I think one of the best things that we can do is in our general teaching, if we will just throw these words out along with other things that we're sharing, if people hear the pastor can say sexual assault, domestic abuse, rape, molestation, if these come up in the list of many of the things you might be preaching about, people begin to understand these are words I can use here. Wow. This is a conversation I can have. Most people, I would say, have never heard the word sexual assault from a pulpit in their life. Hmm. Man, that is a great point. And, and I think one that reproves me and reminds me of how important it is to, to address that, especially if the numbers, like you're saying, are bearing out. This is something that is this is something that is deeply embedded in their soul. Mm -hmm. It's something that they have either sh have shame over or have covered up or have not thought about or just want to ignore. And, and, and a lot of times it makes up their that. identity. You oh, know? yeah. It's, it's so much huge. In what they, you know. And I will often say that assault survivors are often dipping their toe in the water of who is safe to share with. Mm. So one of the best things as a church can do, if these words become part of our normal conversations, already people begin going, oh, there's some safety here. And they might let out small little snippets. They're always going to be sharing small little snippets along the way to see who they can trust and who will receive them. And it's a great way for a church to at least say, this is a place where this is a conversation we can have. It doesn't have to be the final place of the conversation. There are people that can we can lead them to that can help them walk through this. But people need to feel like, oh, my church knows about this and is willing to be honest about it. So often I would think that a victim of sexual assault not just going to come out and be like in a small group setting like, hey, like this happens to me. Are there certain things that you'd recommend for us to like be listening to? how it might show up in those small snippets as people trying to like, um, you know, feel the audience, so to speak, as far as wanting to have the conversation, but they're not ready to say like, I've been a victim of sexual assault. No, I think that's a great question. I think if you yourself have walked down that road, the more you're willing to share snippets of your story, certainly opens the door for people. But if you don't have that story, you don't have to feel like I don't have a role to play. I think when you're listening for, I it's, it's cliche in some way, but so many people will start a conversation with, my friend, I'm worried about a friend. Mm. Or they just start saying, man, sometimes things are, are, are off about this relationship I have, or, or I can't talk about things because people won't like me. I think if you're listening, you yes. can start being clued into things. Yeah, it's interesting you say if, if for, I, I'll say it this way, if by God's grace, he has allowed you to experience something um, and in his perfect divine plan has re redeemed a bad thing in your life. And again, I'm, I'm attempting to speak to mature spiritual leaders here. Mm -hmm. um, somebody like Kimberly, somebody like myself, it may have taken you 5, 10, 20, 25 years to come to grips with everything. But if you're in a place where you can share snippets, um, I, I mentioned a moment ago, whenever I did share my story to our church for the first time, shocking, shocking how many people came to me. I felt the, the exact same way the first time. And I, like you, I was terrified beyond belief the first time I, t well, the first time I told you I was I terrified beyond belief, I remember. but, um, and that's, a, and I will say that while we're on here going it to describe that, if you don't mind, because you, you came in to talk to Heather and I, yeah, so people understand the context. Uh, we were dear friends. We worked together for, oh, eight years at the already, time. Already. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and already you and Heather, very good friends of ours. Mm -hmm. And um, you're my pastor and you're my husband's boss. Mm -hmm. That made it very hard. I was convinced my husband was getting fired that day. It was so hard. Now stop right there for a moment. You were convinced that day yes. your husband was going to get fired because you were about to express that you had been victimized. Yes. It is that confusion that shame yes. brings of, I am guilty. I've done something wrong. And once people understand this about me, then the next obvious step is you have to be rejected. So um, it was, I had a great fear. So really, I had to think whenever I shared what I was going to on in my sermon, I had to think, I thought multiple times, what are my deacons going to do with this? Yes. 
And I know, I know if you're sitting there as a pastor or a deacon or something, you're sitting there thinking, why would she think that? That the, the one has nothing to do with the other. Why would he think that? The one has nothing to do. The answer is the confusion mm-hmm. uh, that the mind plays on you when you're dealing with the shame of sexual assault. It's so true. And when I told my small group girls, I was I was terrified to tell the ladies in my small group. And when I started talking about it, the floodgates opened and I had women coming to me. And now I'm in a place where I think other women say, you need to go. In fact, I've had people come to me. My friend said, I'm supposed to come talk to you <laughs> um, because they realize it's someone that they can talk to. And the floodgates opened. And I even I was very surprised at how many women that I had been close to had stories that I had no clue about. Wow. What a gift. There's many um, different resources we have on the subject, but you've written a lot about this on your blog, right? Tell I us have. a little bit about that. So I have a blog. It is setinsilver.org. Once a month, I dedicate a post of mine to a hope in the healing series. And I write on all things from how do you come alongside a victim of sexual assault, um, things not to say to survivors of sexual assault. Um, Should you share your story about your own sexual assault? I have one coming up soon. Um, Is the Me Too movement for me? So um, I have had the opportunity and I have a lot of people who follow the blog just for that one monthly article. Mm, That's awesome. Now, for our audience, you know, we're talking about pastors and ministry leaders across the world. Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking in their minds as they're hearing your story that maybe they want to start addressing this topic, you know, in whatever, you know, setting they deem proper. But uh, a thought that they might have in the back of their head is, do I need some kind of formalized training before I, I kind of open the floodgates to your point? What What is your thoughts on that? No, you do not need formalized training. I would encourage several things. If you are a ministry leader, take time to do some reading. Mm. Dr. Diane Langberg, she is a Christian counselor who is fabulous on this topic. She has wonderful resources. And I would say start by getting a few of her books and start understanding. The second thing that I would say is start doing some research on Christian counselors or Christian counseling centers in your area that are so specialized in this, you don't have to feel the pressure of, I'm going to start talking about this and inviting people to share their story. And I now have to enter into a long-term counseling situation with them. If you can be that middle person who meets with them two or three times and then encourages them to meet with someone who truly is trained and certified to walk them through the rest of this journey. I know in pastoral counseling, um, we want to encourage encourage people to come in, to gain truth, and to walk out victoriously. Sexual assault is a very long process, and it will require probably more than even a pastor realistically has time to give his congregants. Yeah, I think, you know, that could be a discouragement if you're addressing the topic is like maybe they think they're, they have to be the end-all be-all for, you know, the, these victims in their church, and they're thinking, I, I don't have the capabilities to even address that. And uh, I love that point you make about seeking a professional counselor that does have the tools and the training and equipment to address and try to help support these people. Exactly. And our goal is we want to get them the best help possible, but we want to let them know, let's talk about finding help. And, you know, that way, if they need to come talk to you about something else in the future, the church doors are open, but we're also going to walk with you as you walk with someone helping you in this journey. Now, another common question that comes up, you know, amongst ministry leaders is, this is a tough one. What do we do about predators that are in our own church? It is a, it is a hard concept to think that there are uh, survivors in our church, but that means that more than likely there are also predators in our church. I think there are several aspects we need to look at. I think we need to consider the fact that, once again, if we are going back to using these terms rather commonly from the pulpit— Already, a predator is going to be aware of the fact of this church is discussing things I'm not church. I'm not used to churches discussing. Wow, that's good. Which will already have their radar up. This might not be a great place for me to look for victims. So I want to jump on that if you if I can, and then hear your follow up. If a pastor brings up sexual assault, if a pastor brings up 
um, predators. If the pastor brings up the importance of protecting those who are weak, caring for those who have been abused, the more that's brought up, a predator is going to stand back and be like, this is not allowed here. Similarly, a, a few months ago, to give an analogy, a, a similar type of a thing, um, we were talking through finances at the church, and I specifically addressed scam artists and um, people trying to scam churches, and I, and, I, and I called it out. I said, look, some of you are wolves pretending to be sheep, and you're here because you see a business opportunity in all these sheep. And I'm telling you, we will find you, we will call you out, and we will make sure everybody knows you're here to take advantage of people. And, and I knew deep down, I'm like, thank God, because this is going to be one of those things where if they are there, they're going to run for the hills. You're saying the same thing as it relates to sexual abuse. The more it's brought up, the more it's addressed, if you can throw in those lists of sins that we talk about, oh my goodness, this is not a place that I'm going to be comfortable. They're not going to cover for me here. Exactly. They're always looking for anonymity. And so the thought that these are conversations, this is stuff that people are not sweeping under the rug. Um, it is a very simple frontline defense you can start with immediately. That's a great point. And then I think we also have to be aware of the fact we just need to leave the impression with our people that as a church, we stand with a biblical viewpoint, and this is wrong. We will actively encourage prosecution. We are not, there is nothing so sacred at the church that someone, we would be willing to prosecute them. Yes. No one is above prosecution. Yes. And we need to have safeguards in place. Sometimes we, we take for granted that anyone in a position of power whether it be a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, whether they feel like they're in a position of authority or not, they are, and they have influence over those under them. And if they don't steward that well, they can set themselves up for an abusive situation. And there are very practical things. I think, you know, even this ministry, I remember the very first time we wanted to volunteer for Southern Hills, um, there was a full background check mm -hmm. done on me and my wife. And even that process, you know, um, will help hopefully eliminate, you know, some of those opportunities for predators in the church to be serving, you know, right there with their kids, God forbid, um, and something to be happening. Exactly. So there are steps that churches can take that at least is saying, this is something that we are aware of and we are trying to do dil due diligence on our part. Beautiful. I think some of this also plays into how we uh, the more we speak about it within the church context, it allows parents to be more comfortable to speak about it within their home context and being able to be comfortable with our children talking about um, what to avoid, how to avoid those who would be grooming for sexual assault. How do you have your conversation with young children about what can be touched and what can't be touched um, uh, with your teenagers and, and with your adolescents and, and who to trust even within the church congregation and who not to trust and what places to find. Some of these old church buildings have very uh, dark corners and they have very uh, closed off rooms. And to be able to open up that conversation, suddenly light shines in each and every one of these rooms and, and, um, and makes these conversations more allowable so that if a child, God forbid, is victimized, that child knows these are things we talk about. And immediately they feel a comfortability. I can talk to my mother. I can talk to my father. I can talk to uh, uh, somebody uh, that I trust within the congregation. And as people in ministry, we're always trying to give people tools to have conversations about things. This is another tool we need to give them. Um, there's going to be people sitting in your pews who, who know these things, but how do I bring this up at home? Mm. And we can help families and individuals start a conversation that they know they should have, but they're just really at a loss as how to. Now, this leads us potentially to a deeper question, um, more on a theological issue, but you know, some of our listeners that, uh, out there might be saying like, how can God being so good allow this evil to happen and especially happen in the church? What's your response to that? That is such a great question. And I think anyone who walks through this experience or walks beside someone in this experience gets to a point where they have to say, God, I'm questioning your goodness. I want to believe you're good but how could something so bad happen? And I think it is a process of time, but I think that we can lead survivors to a place where they can see that Jesus is someone mm. who was stripped naked. He was physically abused. He was rejected by his church community. He was shamed publicly. And I think if we can help people see 
Jesus is really the ultimate me too. And uh, it can really change our relationship with him. And there is great healing found there. Now you bring up me too, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but what place does this me too movement that's sweeping our nation and the world for that matter have in our church? I think we need to be willing to have this conversation because Me Too is a conversation that the community is having. And I think they have a lot of good points. I think Me Too has come out and said, let's have a conversation. Me Too has helped people to be aware of the fact you're not alone. There's a lot of people that have this story. And Me Too has helped people to say, let's start using words to express what's happened. As As opposed to bottling it up or lashing out on people. So they're saying, let's come together. You're not alone. Let's talk. Um, Some areas that I think the Me Too movement falls short on is, A, it often leaves our brothers behind who also have stories of sexual assault. It is very easily turned into a movement that all men are bad. And that's not true. And that's certainly not what scripture says. But we also have a lot of brothers in Christ who then were left going, what about me? Um, me too has also led a lot of people to a place of saying, I can use my words and I can begin to feel emotion again. And uh, when you turn off your emotions, you can't just numb one part of you. You numb all of your emotions. And when you start to feel again, anger is one of the ones you're going to feel. And I believe they often push people to feeling their anger deeply, but I feel like they often leave people there. And I feel like it's the church we then can say there are more steps that you can come to afterwards. And I don't often know that the Me Too movement helps people beyond that point. You know, you address some of these issues in your once a month blog on uh, setinsilver.org. And um, I, I think for those who are listening and saying, man, I'd really like to hear more from Kimberly on these issues. I, I'd really like to hear more specifically from her unique perspective. I want to encourage you to go onto the blog. I want you to check it out. Even recently with uh, the several part series, Seven Things Not to Say to a Survivor of Sexual Assault, this is going to give you such great comfort and confidence in dealing with someone. You, you need to read this. We don't know. You don't know. You're listening to this. You don't know the church member. You don't know the niece, the nephew, the child, the spouse that may come to you in the weeks to come, and you say, I don't know what to say. This is written with you in mind to say, hey, look, we get it. No judgment. You don't know what to say. You haven't walked that road. You haven't lived that experience. You don't know what to say. Have Kimberly graciously and patiently and biblically walk you through what you shouldn't say and how you should address these. Check it out. You've got to go to setinsilver.org. Kimberly, we're really thankful that you came on the podcast today, Um, and I'm looking forward to maybe having you in for a follow-up visit. Uh, It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot of fun. What we got to do is we've got to get Jason and Kimberly, Heather and I, you and Christina, and we need to talk about travel because we all like to travel together. I don't know if I have that many mics, but I'll see what I can do. Hey, and I think we should travel to a great location <laughs> to, to film it? that podcast. <laughs> yes. They can hear like the birds on the beach, you know, just oh, in the background, the waves me. crashing on the ocean. That'd be awesome. So, you know, we, we could do it in Togo because you've been to Togo, West Africa to see this. They snooks. do have a beach there. You're right. Yeah, it's true. But that's not the beach you want to go to. I mean, that's just not what I would think of when I think of Caribbean beach to to (laughs) film a podcast, but it works. And and one of these days you got it. You guys are going to go to Togo. Oh yeah. We want to go. Yeah. Want to go to Togo. Um, yeah. And we can't do it at Disney because you guys aren't coming to Disney with us in August. That's true. All I ask is you please buy a lightsaber for me. That's all I ask. I really for real do need to buy you a lightsaber. All my friends in the world, you were the one who would most enjoy that lightsaber. And see, now you've got it recorded. There you go. It's It's official. It's official. Let's talk about Star Wars before we close. Kimberly, I'm just kidding. She just rolled her eyes. Here's the thing about Kimberly. She's not a big Star Wars fan, but of all the movies, and I love all, I love, I love a lot of movies, of all the movies that we've got to watch together, we've watched a lot of Marvel, right? Yes. Of all the movies, I'm guessing that um, the Hunger Games trilogy was probably the one you enjoyed the most. I Am did. I, right? I fell in love with the Hunger Games. I'm getting ready to read through them. Have you not read them? No, I have not. Okay, and I know, know there's what? a prequel now. Yeah. I'm super excited. So They're great. It was worth suffering through 
Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> oh, oh. Those are fighting words right there. This is where my this is where my past a lot of my pastor's friends honestly Kimberly fast start start fast forwarding these episodes and roll their eyes. They're like Josh, such a nerd, such an idiot, likes these things. But Guardians of the Galaxy is definitely an acquired taste and one that I have a great taste for. You hated them. I hated it. It was awful. I <laughs> sat there saying these are moments of my life I will never reach. Which is so funny because she's so into music. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, you like the 80s music. You got to love the 80s oh, music. Oh, well, yeah, but they could have done a lot better with <laughs> 80s music. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Any any parting thoughts for listeners just before we wrap up? I think I'm so grateful that you were willing to listen to this. And if the Lord would begin opening your heart, whether it be a story that you yourself need to start pursuing to share, um, if you've never shared with someone there is a place for you. And if the Lord's burdening your heart that I don't have a story, but I would love to minister to people who do, there is an opportunity for you to serve in this community as well. I want to throw this out there as well. Uh, If you're a pastor listening to this, once I did share my story, I actually had multiple pastors within the ID network contact me um, one-on-one and say, hey, can we talk? I knew exactly what they wanted to talk about. And you know, I don't know if this was true for you, Kimberly, but the first person, once you share your story with the first person, it is like a, like a, a huge thousand pound burden lifted off your shoulders. So true. And if you're a pastor out there, part of the idea network, we're not so large, right? That you can't reach out to me, reach out to me and say, Hey Josh, I just want to talk for 15 minutes. It's about my story. I'll know exactly what you mean and I'll get alone and you'll get alone and we'll FaceTime each other. Or, or if you're more comfortable, we'll just talk on the phone. And I want you to know that I am that guy for you. And we are here for you. And um, and if it's not me, you read my book, maybe. Uh, talk to a friend. Mm-hmm. This is not something you have to carry alone. And trust me, um, there are people that will respond poorly. Yes. But the vast majority of people in your life, they love you. So true. And they're going to be supportive of you. Okay? So before we end the conversation, I want to make sure our guests um, know how they can get in contact with you. Um, should they want to reach out to you for more information? Yes, please do. Um, if you go to setinsilver.org, at the bottom, there are ways in which you can contact me. And on Facebook, Set in Silver as well. Cool. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to today's Idea Talks. If you would like to reach out to us, drop us an email at joshtice at ideanetwork.church. If you benefited from this podcast, we ask that you take a moment to show your support by subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. Thanks again for joining us, and we will see you right here again at the Idea Talks podcast.